Well, folks, good morning. And a happy Easter and a really warm welcome here to Birkhead Free Church. It's great to have you with us. Uh, my name's Peter. I'm the minister here, uh, if we've not met. A special welcome if you're here, uh, maybe as an invited guest. Um, this is a, an invitation service, and so we encourage our own church family to, uh, to bring along uh, their friends or family. So if that's you, um, it's great to have you with us. Hopefully on the way in the door, you've got a, a white sheet like this. And if you're watching online, you can download that from the usual place as well. And if you have that, you'll see all the things we're going to do together um, as we come to God in song and in prayer, as we hear his word, the Bible, uh, read and explained. Those are the things that we do um, every week as we gather. If you're new with us, um, please feel free to join in with us as much or as little of that as you feel uh, comfortable. Uh, we're just glad to have you here. Uh, on the back of the sheet, you'll see uh, a few announcements, notices, things that are happening. It's a bit of a holiday time. Our, our weekly activities are a bit quieter this week, but you'll see all the things that are happening uh, on the back of the sheet there as well. Our call to worship today is from Luke's Gospel and Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. The Apostle Paul says, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And today of all days, we remember that Jesus has died for us, has been raised from death, and now reigns as Lord of all uh, at the right hand of of God. And our first hymn uh, brings those things to mind. God is our maker and our saviour and our risen ruling king. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder. If you're able, let's stand as we sing.
it's great to have the boys and girls with us. In just a minute, you're going to head out to Sunday school groups. We've got some great things planned. When I say we, that's the royal we. Uh, Fiona and Heather have got some great things planned. But before you go, I thought we'd think about the resurrection of Jesus. Now, for the last few weeks, maybe not last week because I wasn't here, I'm not sure, but we've been thinking about big words that end in shun. And one of the words we thought about was resurrection. Now, we think a lot, don't we, boys and girls, about Jesus dying on the cross in our place for our sin. We, we talk about that a lot. But sometimes I think we forget to talk about Jesus being raised back to life. And sometimes we might wonder, well, why is it important? Why is it important that Jesus not only died for us, but was raised again? And I want to give you three things to remember, three objects, in fact, to think about that will help you to remember why Jesus coming back to life is so important. Here's the first one. What is it? It's a seed. Very good. In fact, I can do one better than that. Yesterday from my window, I took this picture. That's the farm. The field has been plowed. That's the farmer planting the seeds. I know virtually nothing about farming, so uh, I'm, I'm in uncharted territory here. But he's, he's plowed it. Now he's planting the seeds. So the first object is a seed. And here's some words from John's Gospel which say, unless a grain of wheat, which is like a seed, falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now Jesus here is talking about farming, isn't he? When you get a seed and you put it in the ground, I suppose it's a bit like what happens when things die, they get buried. But when that seed gets buried, it's not the end of the story, is it? From that seed springs up new plants, new life. And then, of course, I'm not great on biology either, but those plants produce more seeds, more grains, and they can get planted, and then there's more life. So here's the first thing to remember. Jesus is like that seed. He goes down into death, but he's raised up to life, and that brings wonderful new life to us. But you might ask, well, why or how? Well, the, the answer is our next object. Here's the next object. It is a needle and thread. We're on all my specialist subjects today. Not good at this one either, but I do know. In fact, I know some of you kids have sometimes done some sewing at school, haven't you? No? Okay. <laughs> Work with me here. What you do is you get the thread and you put it through the needle, and then when you pass the sharp needle through the cloth or the fabric, it pulls the thread with it. Right? And then you go back and forwards and back and forwards, I think. Is that right? Nod. Just nod your head. That's right. And pretty soon you've sewed something together. And that needle is a bit like Jesus. He goes through death and then out the other side into life. And if we're friends with him, if we're joined to him, just like the thread is to the needle, he will take us through death one day and then on into eternal life as well. And then here's the last object to help you remember why the resurrection is so important. It's a crown for King Jesus. Here's the thing. If Jesus spent all of his life promising that he would die and that then he would be raised to life three days later and then he did it, I reckon that means we have to take everything else Jesus said very seriously indeed. Who can promise to die and promise to be raised and then do it? Only King Jesus. So, boys and girls, this Easter, don't think about eggs and chocolate. I mean, I'm sure you will. But think about seeds that are planted that bring new life. Think about needles that go through fabric, just like Jesus goes through death. And then think about the crown for King Jesus, who now rules and reigns as Lord of all. You can have some chocolate as well but remember those things. Fantastic. Boys and girls, you're going to head on to your Sunday school groups, but I'm going to pray, first of all, that God would help you and help us to learn more of him today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice today and we thank you today that your son Jesus not only died for us, but has been raised to life. And Lord, we pray that whatever our age and wherever we learn, 
you would help each of us to know him better today. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Fantastic. Boys and girls, why don't you head off to your Sunday school groups. Your leaders will show you where to go. If you're a bit new, you can just follow the crowd out. Fantastic. Well, we have been praying. We're going to continue uh, in prayer just now. And uh, here comes one of our church members, Mike. Uh, he's coming from the back because he's doing double duty today. So thank you, Mike, for leading us. And, um, as Mike comes forward, again, shall we bow our heads? Let's join together as we pray. Let's pray. Almighty Father, today we come together at Easter remembering the incredible truth the truth that God loved mankind the truth that he sent his prophets to tell us that he would send a savior the Messiah who arrived in the form of a baby called Jesus as it is written in John 3 God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life Lord, you willingly, willingly accepted the death penalty for us. Your sacrifice was so complete that no sin is too great for you. Lord, we believe and trust in you. Though the stain of sin mars our lives, though our failings to live up to the standards we set ourselves constantly frustrate and disappoint us, we remember that the first message of Easter was spoken to two women by an angel. Do not be afraid for he is risen. No longer is mankind separated from God. As believers born again into unity, accepted by God and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we stand saved and as your children. Father, we pray that this Easter, those who are still searching can discern this miraculous gift, the greatest gift on earth, the greatest gift that there has ever been freely given, a promise once accepted, transformed and reborn into a new mortal life and a promise for eternal life hereafter. There will be no more pain and no more suffering, a gift beyond human measure. We also pray that the children growing up today who are maybe too young to comprehend this gift can at least have some understanding that Easter is about you and your love for us rebirth and something precious. Father, we come to you now in the silence of our hearts, where in peace we lay our failings and our troubles at your feet. Father, we give thanks for, for this Easter for our church family and our friends and family. We are lucky enough to live in this wealthy Western world, and as we do, we think about those less fortunate than ourselves. We pray that they may find some comfort this Easter. We also pray that those who are in need and in countries outside our own see you and become closer and, and, and know you. We pray that the veil is lifted and that they see your truth. Father, we thank you for bringing Brian and Cheryl to us safely. We pray that their work is successful and that together we can bring the Christian faith to many more people in this part of Scotland. We pray for all Christian leaders at this time that they will bring a clear message of the gospel to those who will listen. We know that living as profession, professing Christians has its challenges. In a world which fights your good and holy law, in a world which loves to do wrong and rejects what is right, in a world where conflict seems almost the norm, we pray for the strength to stand against those who are against you, that they may stand firm and stay true. As conflict continues in Ukraine and once again erupts in the West Bank, we pray, for the, we pray for the innocent lives that are being decimated. We pray for their protection and that those in power who are, who are ruining lives come to their senses. Lord, we commit these prayers to you now. 
we commit the prayers and troubles of our hearts to you also. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Amen. Thank you, Mike, for leading us. And um, thanks, too, for, for leading us in prayer for Brian and Cheryl Roby. Um, some of you are thinking, who on earth is that? Uh, Brian and Cheryl are a couple from the United States uh, who arrived this week um, on Thursday here in Murray. They're currently staying with uh, Chris and Fiona Harris, and they're due to be with us for at least the next three years, um, serving alongside us in, in, in gospel work, um, particularly based in Elgin, uh, once our two congregations are linked. And um, they will hopefully appear at some point. They've been at the Elgin service this morning. They're going to come and join us today. Uh, so don't, don't all turn around and stare at them when they walk in uh, later on. Um, but do greet them at the end. There'll be a chance, hopefully, to meet them uh, there as well. Well, just before uh, Gavin comes to read for us from uh, the Bible, we're going to sing again. And um, here's a song that speaks of Jesus, risen, ruling, and reigning as Lord. So if you're able, let's stand once again. Today's reading is taken from the book of Acts, starting at chapter, sorry, sorry, sorry again, book of Acts, chapter 17, starting at verse 16, and this will be on the screen, and if you're following in the Bibles, that'll be on page 1113. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-freeing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. 
All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spend their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with, with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in his in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. This is the word of God. Amen. Thanks so much, uh, Gavin, for reading. What we're going to do now is, is what we do every week, which is to spend uh, about 20 minutes or so uh, thinking about that part of the Bible that's just been read for us. What is it? What does it say? Is it true? What does it mean? Uh, what impact should it have uh, on our lives? So you, you probably want to keep it open in front of you. That would be helpful. And um, as we often do on the, the service sheet as well, there's a few headings there that'll at very least show you where we're going together. And uh, some people even like to use it to take notes as well. Uh, but because we believe this is God's word and not mine, I'm going to pray for God's help for me and for us to understand it. So let's briefly pray together. Father, we thank you that you're a God who speaks. Whoever we are today, as we gather here, we pray that you might speak to each of us. In our doubt, in our faith, in our uncertainty, in our questioning and searching. Lord, please make yourself known to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to start with a public confession. I really like country music. In fact, I'm getting applause, that's good. You've got no taste, Ian Davis, neither have I. In fact, on a, on a, a trip that our family are privileged to have later this year, we'll, we'll be heading uh, to do a house swap in, in Alabama, if you can believe it. And um, that's good for a few reasons, partly because when you're in northern Alabama, it's only a few uh, hours over the border into Tennessee where you can visit Dollywood. So I can report back later in the year when I've been to that sacred ground. Another of my favorites, though, is Chris Rea. In fact, my favorite Christmas pop song is Driving Home for Christmas. But this is Easter, not Christmas, so I need to tell you about that another day. I did hear, though, the other week, another one of Chris Rea's songs. It's called, Tell Me There's a Heaven. And here are some of the words. Every night, a baby dies. Every night, a mama cries. What makes those men do what they do to make that person black and blue? Tell me there's a heaven. Where all these people go, tell me that they're happy now. Tell me that it's so. 
I'm watching them in tears of pain. I'm watching them suffer. Tell me there's a heaven. Tell me that it's true. Tell me there's a reason why I'm seeing what I do. And Chris Rea is not alone in writing songs about the pain and the hurt of life. I guess we all relate to those kind of songs, don't we? We look at the world around us and at our own lives and we see plenty of trouble and sorrow and pain and hardship. And we want something to be done about it, don't we? We find ourselves longing for a better world, don't we? Now, of course, there is, the, there is much that's good in our world. As Christians, we believe that a good God has made a good world. There are good things to enjoy, like lighter spring evenings and longer days. There are times when it's good to be alive. But our lives are also marked by plenty of times of sadness, whether it's in your own family or on the national news. There is so much injustice, unfairness, corruption, hurt, pain, and all the rest. And yet, we long, don't we, for justice and fairness and goodness and honesty. We long for a world where the terrible destruction of war and the sadness of death is gone. And even if you don't like country music, maybe you can sympathize with Chris Rea. Tell me there's a heaven in the midst of so much sadness. Tell me there's a day when wrongs will be put right. Because I find myself longing for something or somewhere different and better. And if that's you, and I guess it might be, This is one reason why Easter Sunday and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is so very important. The the, the real, actual, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus, Christians believe, is the most momentous moment in the history of the world. That's what the Bible claims. And the earliest Christians spoke about the resurrection again and again and again. We heard just that in our reading from Acts chapter 17 earlier. There the Apostle Paul was traveling around the the, the known world. He was speaking in Athens at that time. He wasn't there on a weekend break, but on a missionary journey. You heard that he was debating and discussing and reasoning with people, trying to persuade them that Jesus has indeed risen from death. Having said that, Lots of people didn't have a clue what Paul was going on about, which is a comfort to preachers the world over. Just look again at verse 18. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with them. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. And they said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Paul preaches about the resurrection, but most people are here haven't got a clue what he's going on about. And maybe you're here with us in the building or watching online today, and maybe you feel the same. And if that's you, can I say, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching on. Can I also say to you, if you are going to understand Christianity... If you're going to understand what makes Jesus so unique and why we believe he is relevant to you today, whoever you are, you have to understand that Jesus rose from the dead. You need to know why Christians everywhere in Paul's day and today speak again and again about Jesus and the resurrection. And on your sheet you'll see there are just a few implications for us today if indeed Christ was raised from the dead. Here's the first. The resurrection tells me there's a God. Now to answer Chris Rea's question, if there's going to be a heaven, there has to be a God. And the resurrection tells me that there is. Now look, the, the people of first century Athens who heard Paul give this sermon certainly hoped that, what, that there was a God. They were pretty religious, in fact. Look what Paul says to them in verse 22. 
Paul stood up and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your object of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. You are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you today. See, the people in first century Athens, they, they worshipped many different things. They weren't quite confident, though, they had God right, or they had the right God. So they hedged their bets with an altar to an unknown God. Now look, in 21st century Scotland, you won't find many people putting up altars to anything. But I reckon in the same way, most people do have a hunch, or at least a hope, that there is a God up somewhere, up there somewhere. But if they're honest, he's kind of mysterious and unknown to them. God is perhaps not something we speak about much publicly in our culture. But as a church leader, I'm, I'm in the, the privileged position where, where people will sometimes speak to me. Sometimes. And I can tell you that most people I speak to, and probably more than you realize, do think about the big questions of life. Is there a God? Is there a heaven? Is there any hope? I don't meet many people who are flat-out atheists. I meet many more who would describe themselves as agnostic. They're not sure what to believe. They like to think there's a God, but they're uncertain. That's verse 23, isn't it? It's the people of Athens hedging their bets, not quite sure. The altar to an unknown God. And Paul says, look... I'm here to tell you, to give you certainty in all your searching and uncertainty. Uh, we often uh, run something here called Christianity Explored. It's a, a seven-week course that takes people through Mark's gospel, which is one of the eyewitness accounts of, of Jesus' life. And it's a chance to discuss that and to ask questions and, and bring your doubts and you know, all that kind of stuff. And one question that often gets raised is this. If there's a God, how can I know what he's like? Many agree it would be good to know God, but how? How can we know him? That kind of information seems a bit beyond us, doesn't it? And you might think when Paul says this, you're ignorant, but I'm going to tell you all about it. You might think he seems a bit arrogant. You know, he's wandered into Athens, center of learning in the ancient world. He's standing before a bunch of philosophers who've probably got more PhDs than I have GCSEs. I did my education in England, so you'll have to do the translation. But you see the point. Here he is, and he says to them, I'm going to tell you about what you don't know. Imagine if I walked into the philosophy department at Aberdeen University after the Easter break, and I stood up before this crowd of, of eloquent and eminent philosophers and said, these things you're uncertain about, don't worry. I'm here. I'll straighten it out for you. That would seem arrogant, wouldn't it? It would seem like I have a hugely overinflated view of my own importance. But we need to be clear that that is not what Paul is doing. And that is not what the Christian faith is about. We are not certain about the existence and character of God because we have worked it out, because we are cleverer than other people. Not at all. We can't know God because we're clever or because I'm clever. We can't know God because we're arrogant either. No, we can know God because he has chosen to reveal himself, to, to make himself known. In a person, his son Jesus, in history, he walked on this planet. He taught in a way that no one had heard before. He did things that no one had seen before. He did things that, that demonstrated he was quite out of this world. To come back to the, the Christianity Explored course, one of the things I love to do with people who are new to church or, or, or aren't sure about Jesus 
is, is to, to read with them or just to give them a, a copy of one of the Gospels. And time and again, as people encounter Jesus in the pages of, say, Mark's Gospel, they are surprised, astonished by what they find there. Very few of us, I think, as, as kind of thinking adults, have been through that process. Let me invite you to do it. If you'd like to do that, you could today pick up one of our welcome packs. You'll find them at the end of the rows. And amongst the bits and bobs in there is a copy of Mark's Gospel that you could take away and read. And as you journey through Mark and see the life and the teachings and the miracles of Jesus, the thing that clinches it, as we saw with the kids, is that this man, Jesus, was killed, crucified on a Roman cross, certified as dead, put in a tomb, and then three days later rose from the dead. Again, as we saw with the children, if Jesus said that, promised that, and then did that, well, then suddenly you and I have to take him very seriously indeed. Can you see? As Paul said in Athens, it's all about Jesus and the resurrection. If he claimed to be God, which he did, if he promised he would die, which he did, if he promised he would rise, which the Bible and the eyewitnesses claim he did, then Jesus is someone I must listen to. So that the real, actual, bodily resurrection of Jesus shows me that God does exist. But not only that, because of the resurrection, we can see not just that God is real, but we can know what God is like. And so the, the God that, that you might not know, I can tell you about, not because I'm clever, but because together we can look at Jesus. Again, if that's you, you're looking into these things, thank you for being here. Welcome. We'd love to invite you back to keep on looking, reading, thinking about Jesus. First, the resurrection tells me there's a God. Second, much more briefly, the resurrection tells me there's a heaven. Chris Rea sang it. Don't so many of us think it. Tell me there's a heaven. Now, whether or not you think of yourself as religious, I reckon the truth is that most of us long very acutely to know that there's more to life than this. In the course of my work, it won't surprise you to know, I, I attend and lead many funerals. At moments like that, the friends and family of the deceased long more than ever and ask more than ever, is there anything beyond this? Well, look, again, the resurrection of Jesus tells me, yes, there is a heaven. There is life beyond the grave. There is a way of having life beyond death. Not least of all because Jesus has gone through death and out the other side, as it were, into everlasting life. Let me be honest with you and say, I I wish, how I wish, that everyone would engage with this important issue during their lifetime, before it's too late. I do consider it a great responsibility and a huge privilege to be entrusted with conducting someone's funeral, to, to sit with grieving families, to hear the story of the deceased's Life, all they did, all they achieved, all the things that they were busy with in life. But that's the point, isn't it? Life is so busy for us. So hectic that the demands of life day to day, week to week are extraordinary. And I reckon that, that so many people are engaged in so many things. They devote themselves to, to, to pleasure and work and business and family, good things. And yet again and again, so many people seem to give no thought or little thought to, to this greatest of all questions. Where is my life heading? And what happens after I die? Is there really any more important issue to get to grips with? 
And so look, on this Easter Sunday morning, if you are unsure about God and about heaven and about hell and about life after death, can I challenge you and, and would you resolve to say, yes, okay, I will get to grips with this? And can you see, if that's you, that, that, that a good place, the best place to start is with Jesus and the resurrection? Again, because if he is who he says he is, if he really did rise from death, then you can look no further in your quest for truth. Jesus and the resurrection. Will you get to grips for it? By the way, if Jesus has gone through death, and out the other side, then yes, this life is not all there is. Yes, there is life beyond death. Yes, there is heaven. But I need to be straight with you, just as Jesus was, who spoke repeatedly, not just about heaven, but also about hell and about judgment. More on that in a moment. The resurrection tells me there's a God. The resurrection tells me there's a heaven. Third, the resurrection tells me that there is justice. Look at verse 31 now. It's on the screen. For he, that is God, God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now, those of you with, with kids at home, perhaps especially teenagers at home, will hear this a lot. But mum, but dad, it's not fair. Thank you, audience participation. <laughs> it's not fair. And we often respond, yes, life's not fair. That's what we say, isn't it? But more seriously, how many times have you found yourself thinking or even saying that when trouble and calamity comes upon you in life? We do look at all the injustices of the world, including ordinary lives wrecked in war zones, and we think, even if we don't say, where's the justice? It's not fair. But the great news of Jesus and the resurrection is that God cannot stand in justice either, and ultimately he will not tolerate it. Again, verse 31, he set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. That is Jesus. Do you see, the resurrection shows that there is going to be a day of reckoning and of judgment when wrongs will be put right. And let me tell you, I, I think you should think that, that that is actually a wonderful thought. That the risen Jesus sees everything, knows everything, and one day he will act just as a judge in a courtroom does to bring justice, to rid the world of evil and suffering and wrongdoing, and to put things right again. There's been great play in, in the media of late about the, the International Criminal Court putting out a warrant for Putin's arrest on charges of war crimes. But let's be honest, unless Putin falls from power, which doesn't look likely at the minute, you'd have to say the chances of him being arrested, let alone prosecuted, seem minuscule. And so we rail against the tyrants of the day and say, is there no justice? Will they just get away with this? But do you see, the resurrection of Jesus means that this life is not all there is, that Jesus will one day return as judge, and so tyrants, big and small, from war criminals to domestic abusers, will, will one day have their day in court. Because they will all stand before God as judge. He set a day. He's going to judge the world. It's good news, isn't it? It means that all the injustices you have suffered as well will be put right. That is good news. But when you stop and think, it's also sobering news. Because it does mean that all wrongs will be addressed. And I know that my life is far from perfect. And so it means that all my wrongs will be addressed. 
and all of yours. Especially, says the Bible, especially when it comes to the way that, that we have treated God. That's the big issue here. Look, I, I don't know the details of your life. But for myself, I know that I haven't even lived up to my own standards, let alone the standards of a holy God. Far too often, God has been treated as if he were like a footnote in the page of my life. And the Bible's pretty straight with us. It says, look, at heart, that's actually how we are. It's what we like, it's what we're like. We are people who tend to, to, to want to push God away, to live life our way and not his. And so the thought of justice being done is good but also sobering because what about the wrongs that I've done? What about my sin? And what about yours? How can I be sure of heading to heaven and not to hell when I deserve God's judgment? But again, the message of the resurrection of Jesus points us back to the cross of Jesus. What on earth was Jesus doing there, being crucified? This same Jesus who is coming as judge came first as saviour, as rescuer. The truth is we need a way to be forgiven. We need a route back to God. Maybe it seems odd on Resurrection Sunday to be talking about Jesus' death on Good Friday. Come to that. Maybe it seems odd to you. We call it Good Friday. What could be good about the unjust execution of a good man and the Son of God? The good news is that Jesus' death on the cross is the way, is the way that God is both loving toward us and brings judgment on our sin, as he must. God comes himself in the person of his son to die not because he deserved it, but because I did and you did. In the courtroom, as it were, the judge steps down from the bench and walks into the dock and takes the punishment upon himself. The truth is, you and I deserve to be punished, but Jesus is punished instead. You and I deserve separation from God. Jesus experiences that in our place. You and I deserve death and not life from God, but instead death falls on Jesus and life is offered to us. And all of that demands from you and me some kind of a response. The, the, the death and res resurrection of Jesus is, is offered to us, if you like, as a gift. But with a gift, there's still a choice to make. Do you want it? Will you take it? Have you received it? That's number four. The resurrection of Jesus tells us there's a choice. A choice to make. And did you see, just to come back to Athens and to Paul, did you see that when he shared this news... Even back then in Athens, there were a number of different responses. Some people, verse 32, just didn't want to know. Have a look. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But, here's your second response. Others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And again, let me say, maybe that's you today if you're here or if you're watching online. Maybe this is all a bit new to you. Maybe you're not sure, but you are intrigued, you're interested, you'd like to hear more. Can I say to you, please do not let this moment pass, this opportunity to explore more. Come back. Come back next week. We meet every week. Join us online, even better. Join us in person. To do so will cost you nothing, but it could change your life forever. Will you come and join us and keep exploring? But there was a third response. You've probably seen it, verse 34. Some people became followers of Paul and believed. 
Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. And maybe, I don't know, I don't know your heart, but maybe for some of us here today, it is time that you responded to this message. Maybe you've been sitting in this congregation for many years, or many months, or many weeks, and you know in your heart that Christ has been raised, but you also know in your heart that you have not yet received him as your savior and your king. What better day than today to come to God simply in prayer, to ask him yourself to receive Jesus as the savior from sin and the Lord of your life. Some of you have heard enough now to do that. And maybe today is the day. If that's you, I'd love to talk with you more about responding to Jesus and finding faith in him. Let me say thank you for listening. If it is true, the resurrection changes everything. How will you respond? Let's pray together, shall we? Let's just take a moment of quiet reflection, perhaps to think on where you are, what you know of Christ and how you ought to respond. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Christ has died and Christ has risen. And that Christ will come again. As the creed says, to judge the living and the dead. Father, we pray that you would help each of us to know that, to be sure of it, and to receive Christ as Savior in these days before he returns as judge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to sing just now. Let me just give a word, though, about what's going to happen after that. Um, Emma half stood up. You can fully stand up if you want. Emma, come and join me. Emma's going to lead us in song just in in a moment. After that, we'll be sharing what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. Uh, This is a a simple, a a brief meal of bread and wine, uh, which points us to, reminds us of uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Uh, Let me say, if you're joining us today as a guest, um, this is something that we'd encourage you to observe rather than participate in at the moment. Um, Again, I suppose it it, it will uh, be a pointer and a reminder to you of uh, Jesus' body broken, his blood shed on the cross uh, for us. Um, To those who are going to join us, who are trusting in Jesus as Lord, uh, hopefully you've grabbed little pots of bread and wine. If you haven't, as we sing, please do just head to the back and feel free without embarrassment just to grab those and come back to your seat. But for now, here are some words from from the Psalms, from Psalm 16, uh, written many hundreds of years before the time of Jesus, and yet speaking about God not abandoning his son to the grave, uh, but raising him up to new life. So as Emma leads us, let's stand as we sing. Constantly, I'll set the Lord alone, because he is at my right hand, I'll not be overthrown, therefore my heart is glad. Oh, yeah.
Do sit. Now, if you've been in perhaps different places or different churches, you, you, you might have seen this, this meal uh, given different names. Uh, it has a variety of names. I want to share uh, three of them with you today, uh, which point us to what this meal is all about. First of all, you will sometimes have heard this meal called Eucharist. And that is a word that, that simply means thanksgiving. Just means thanksgiving. And so as those who belong to Christ, as we take bread and wine, this is a meal, an act of thanksgiving. We look back, as we have been today, to the cross. To Christ's death in our place. And to his glorious resurrection. And we do so with Eucharist, with thanksgiving. For all he's done for us. Sometimes, as on your sheet today, you'll hear it called communion. And that is a word, of course, that, that's all about communion or connection with God. We believe that God is present with us by his spirit. And as we take bread and wine, this is a means of his goodness and grace to us, which deeply reminds us of Jesus today. And then sometimes you'll have heard it called the Lord's Supper. Now, in some ways, that's the word that makes us look back to the last supper that Jesus shared with his disciples. We'll be reading some, some words of scripture about that meal in a moment. But it should also make us look forward in joyful expectation to what Jesus calls the wedding supper of the Lamb or the great feast of heaven. Because one day we will share in joy, in fellowship, in food, with Jesus himself and with all his faithful people who have gone before. We look back with thankfulness. Today we know communion with God and we look ahead to the day Christ returns and his people are taken to be with him in everlasting fellowship and feasting and joy. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we do not presume to come to this meal and to your table trusting in our own righteousness, our own goodness, our own moral performance, but only in your abundant mercy. We know, Heavenly Father, that we are not worthy to have a place here. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But we thank you that in Christ you have been merciful. And so we pray that you would grant us, enable us, gracious Lord, so to eat and to drink these signs and symbols of the flesh and blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, so that in him our sinful bodies might be made clean, our souls might be washed from sin through his precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell by faith in him and he in us. In Jesus' name. If you're a follower of Christ, you are welcome to join us 
here. And so have your pots of bread and wine to hand. The same Apostle Paul who preached in Athens wrote these words. For what I received from the Lord, I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let me invite you to take and eat in remembrance of Christ, whose body was broken for you. Paul goes on, in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So will you take and drink in remembrance of Christ whose blood was shed for you? And he closed by saying, for whenever you do this, whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you, we, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Which is a reminder, as we saw in Paul's sermon in Athens, that God has set a day when his son will return as the savior of his people and the judge of all the world. Let's pray again together. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and worship and praise that even when we were still far from you, still called your enemies, still lost in our waywardness and sin, Even then, you sent your son, and you met us in your son and brought us home. Keep us firm, we pray, in the hope that you have set before us, so that we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to close in song. Here comes Emma again to lead us. We love to sing from the Psalms. They are the songbook of the Bible. Here are great words, famous words to end with from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present aid. Most of all, we see that at the cross where Christ has come to save. So as Emma leads us, let's stand as we sing. our refuge and our strength and ever present aid then therefore though the earth gives way we will not be afraid though mountains fall into
remain standing for a final prayer. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor is not in vain. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with us all this day and always. Amen. Folks, please do sit. And just as we close, let me say uh, three things. Uh, First of all, if you want to grab one of our welcome packs, if you're new with us, please do that. You'll find them at the end of the rows. There's a copy of Mark's Gospel uh, in there. Uh, Second of all, um, Brian and Cheryl have joined us uh, at the back. There they are. Give us a wave, Brian and Cheryl. Don't be shy. There we go. Um, I told them not to all turn around and stare at you as you came in. They didn't do that. They're well behaved. So a chance to meet and greet with uh, Brian and Cheryl as well. Speaking of which, please do all stick around. uh, Tea and coffee uh, at the back as well. Thank you.